Hotep, New York. You know, I thought D.C. was the hot spot in the nation, but there's always something going on in New York, you know? Every time I come here, there's always something going on. I'm, as usual, as usual, I'm very pleased to, to be here and to have another opportunity to share with you some of my research information that I've been working on diligently over the last several years and have the opportunity to share it with you. And I trust that you receive the knowledge in the spirit in which it was generated. Tonight, as usual, I'm going to be sharing with you information in several different formats through speech, as well as through visuals, because for those of you who don't know, um, I'm not trained as a historian. Uh, my primary training is in the field of design and advertising, art. But after I graduated from Howard and became aware of the fact that I had been miseducated, I began to assume responsibility for re-educating myself. I think Dr. Carter B. Woodson, <laughs> Dr. Woodson said it best when he stated that every person had two educations, one that is given to him, the other which he gives himself, another two, the latter is by far more significant because everything that is important in a person's life is that which they must seek out for themselves. It constitutes their real education. So it's all right to get the paper so that you can move out into society and do other things, but just don't think that that paper is your passport to success. We have an obligation and a responsibility to see to it that we put into our minds, put into our consciousness, put into our spirit, knowledge of our history, our culture, our ancestors, and our God, so that we can exist within the society and keep our sanity as we continue to build a better place for those who will come behind us. That is our obligation, that is our responsibility. I want to begin my remarks this evening by first acknowledging the memory and the spirit of a brother who is well known here in Harlem, brother Dr. John Henry Clark, who is now an ancestor. brother who I am obligated to acknowledge for having put me on the path, put me more firmly, put my feet more firmly on the path so that I could be very clear about the work that I must do throughout my life. And so wherever I go, I have to acknowledge the spirit of, of Professor Clark and pray that I continue to do work that will make him proud. Pray that his spirit will continue to infuse me with with the words and the knowledge which will allow me to do my small part to continue his work. Because much of what I am today, I, I owe to, to his guidance, to his direction. I also, uh, I've been traveling quite a bit this month and just arrived home last night after having been on the road for about five days and was checking my email last night around 1.30. And I uh, saw a message that uh, Professor uh, Linda Jeffrey's mother had passed uh, 10 days ago. So I also want to extend my condolences uh, to Brother Jeffrey's and, and his family and ask that you all keep him in your prayers. Now one of the realities of life is that <clears throat> we are going to see brothers and sisters come and go. And that is a part of life. That is the price we pay for being born. But also there is another aspect of life, and that is the fact that the life is continual. Life is cyclical. And that those who leave us in the physical 
still have the ability to commune with us in the spiritual as long as we speak their names yes. and keep their memories alive. Yes. And so it is not superstitious, it's not sacrilegious, it is of utmost importance, importance that we understand what we must do in order to remain connected with those who are now ancestors, yes. those who can fuel our thoughts and our actions with a spirit and an energy far greater than we can access here on the physical plane of existence. So I always am, am, am obligated to acknowledge that part of my reality. My topic for this evening is African Americans, history, new perspectives for a new millennium. There's been quite a bit of talk as of late about this, this new millennium, Y2K problem. I just heard on the news last week that, that there's another computer-related problem that is going to be just as bad, if not worse, than Y2K problem. Uh, not very many people have heard about it. it. It turns out that computer programmers for years would always end their program with a series of nines. And so this September the 9th, 1999, nine, 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 is going to pose a very serious problem for those computers that are still operating off of the old program. It is a problem that could be as potentially devastating as the Y2K problem. And so, you're probably going to be hearing quite a lot about conflicts in the future. Conflicts have always arisen and will continue to arisen. Matter of fact, history is a story of conflicts. History also, as Professor Clark tells us, History is also a record of the accomplishments of people. And if we see that we are headed for conflict, then all we have to do is to study the various manifestations of that conflict so that we can prepare ourselves to be in the right place at the right time. History is always written by the survivors of any conflict. And so for those people who are totally dependent on technology and computers, who will probably bug out, who will probably commit suicide, who will probably be totally emotionally, physically, and psychologically devastated by whatever happens. Those who are not part of that consciousness can use this as an opportunity yes. to take advantage of yes. doors that will be open to you. Yes. So in the, midst, in the midst of their disaster, there are opportunities yes. for success for those who have their eyes open. Yes. So I, I would encourage you all to open your eyes. Yes. Some of the topics that I'm going to be discussing this evening as we talk about uh, new perspectives for a new millennium are issues that I feel are, are crucial to us as a people if we are going to be around in the new millennium. Because I feel that we're, we're at a very serious crossroads right now. When you consider everything that has been done to us, that continues to be done to us, and that more than likely will not cease at any point in time within the next two or three years, if we don't become more conscious of the problems that have been placed in our way, then we may not be here 200 years from now. Matter of fact, I had a dream about a month or so ago, it was really more like a nightmare. And I dreamt that it's maybe 50 years in the future. And a young girl, I don't know who she was, she wasn't African, but a young girl was given an assignment to write for class. And that assignment was, whatever happened to black people? And as she went home to, to search the internet and to search the, the various CD-ROMs and, and other resources she had available to her, to her, she found story after story after story of problems that we were confronted with that we did not deal with effectively. And as a result, we set the stage for others to determine it was time to get rid of us. And thus, we were no longer around. And our removal was deemed justifiable in the eyes of others who see us or saw us as a problem. 
I think, I think it's clear. I think it's clear that many Europeans don't like us here. It's clear. And so I think it's futile to beg or to pray for them to have a change of heart. I think it is. At least based on my study of their history and their interaction with us throughout their history. I don't think things are going to change dramatically within the next two, three, four hundred years. So given the historical realities that have been presented to us, I think our only recourse is begin to take more serious steps ourselves to protect ourselves and ensure that there will be a place for us in the world in the years to come, in the centuries to come. And I think we're at a point in time where if we don't do it, it's our problem. Based on, based on our knowledge of the history of our interaction with our former enslavers, okay? So with that said, let me move into my presentation. I want to begin my talk this evening by establishing an operational framework from which I will <clears throat> present my information. And this operational framework is rooted in three very basic and very fundamental realities. The first reality is that history shows beyond a shadow of a doubt <clears throat> that humanity began in Africa over 200,000 years ago. There's no debate about that. History shows that all races evolved from Africans through mutation, gene flow, genetic drift, and recombination of genetic material. That is a historical and scientifically proven reality. Research shows that civilization began in Africa in the Nile Valley country, the nation of Kemet, which we now call today Egypt, and that Kemet laid the cornerstone for the ancient civilizations of Greece and Rome, which established the foundation for civilizations in France, Germany, Italy, England, and ultimately right here in the United States of America. There's no question about that. And so if we begin to look at that evidence, then we have to be clear or become clearer of a specific reality. And some of those realities are realities that we have to determine how we're going to deal with. Case in point, I want to share just a few visuals with you to, to reinforce some of these facts. And great. I don't know. Let's see here. Great, okay. This is just an over, overlay, <coughs> overhead from the September 97, 1997 issue of National Geographic magazine, which had an article about the oldest human footprints ever found on Earth. These footprints were discovered in South Africa in an area near Cape Town about three years ago. I had an opportunity to visit South Africa twice last year. And during the summer, during July,